This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Chapter 20, Part 4 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. 3. The Edict of Milan secured the revenue as well as the peace of the Church. The Christians not only recovered the lands and houses of which they had been stripped by the persecuting laws of Diocletian, but they acquired a perfect title to all the possessions which they had hitherto enjoyed by the connivance of the magistrate. As soon as Christianity became the religion of the emperor and the empire, the national clergy might claim a decent and honourable maintenance, and the payment of an annual tax might have delivered the people from the more oppressive tribute which superstition imposes on her votaries. But as the wants and expenses of the church increased with her prosperity, the ecclesiastical order was still supported and enriched by the voluntary oblations of the faithful. Eight years after the Edict of Milan, Constantine granted to all his subjects the free and universal permission of bequeathing their fortunes to the Holy Catholic Church, and their devout liberality, which during their lives was checked by luxury and avarice, flowed with a profuse stream at the hour of their death. The wealthy Christians were encouraged by the example of their sovereign, an absolute monarch who is rich without patrimony, may be charitable without merit, and Constantine, too easily believed, that he should purchase the favour of heaven, if he maintained the idol at the expense of the industrious, and distributed among the saints the wealth of the Republic. The same messenger who carried over to Africa the head of Maxentius might be entrusted with an epistle to Caecilian, the Bishop of Carthage. The Emperor acquaints him that the treasurers of the province are directed to pay into his hands the sum of three thousand folles or eighteen thousand pounds sterling, and to obey his further requisitions for the relief of the churches of Africa, Numidia, and Mauritania. The liberality of Constantine increased in a just proportion to his faith and to his vices. He assigned in each city a regular allowance of corn to supply the fund of ecclesiastical charity, and the persons of both sexes who embraced the monastic life became the peculiar favourites of their sovereign. The Christian temples of Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Constantinople, etc., displayed the ostentatious piety of a prince, ambitious in a declining age to equal the perfect labours of antiquity. The form of these religious edifices was simple and oblong, though they might sometimes swell into the shape of a dome, and sometimes branch into the figure of a cross. The timbers were framed, for the most part, of cedars of Libanus. The roof was covered with tiles, perhaps of gilt brass, and the walls, the columns, the pavement, were encrusted with variegated marbles. The most precious ornaments of gold and silver, of silk and gems, were profusely dedicated to the service of the altar, and this specious magnificence was supported on the solid and perpetual basis of landed property. In the space of two centuries, from the reign of Constantine to that of Justinian, the eighteen hundred churches of the empire were enriched by the frequent and unalienable rights of the prince and people. An annual income of six hundred pounds sterling may be reasonably assigned to the bishops, who are placed at an equal distance between riches and poverty, but the standard of their wealth insensibly rose with the dignity and opulence of the cities which they governed. An authentic but imperfect rent-roll specifies some houses, shops, gardens, and farms, which belong to the three Basilicoi of Rome, St. Peter, St. Paul, and St. John Lateran, in the provinces of Italy, Africa, and the East. They produced, besides a reserve rent of oil, linen, paper, aromatics, etc., a clear annual revenue of 22,000 pieces of gold, or 12,000 pounds sterling. In the age of Constantine and Justinian, the bishops no longer possessed, perhaps they no longer deserved, the unsuspecting confidence of their clergy and people. The ecclesiastical revenues of each diocese were divided into four parts for the respective uses of the bishop himself, of his inferior clergy, of the poor, and of the public worship, and the abuse of this sacred trust was strictly and repeatedly checked. The patrimony of the church was still subject to all the public compositions of the state, 
the clergy of Rome, Alexandria, Chesionica, etc., might solicit and obtain some partial exemptions, but the premature attempt of the great council of Rimini, which aspired to universal freedom, was successfully resisted by the son of Constantine. 4. The Latin clergy, who erected their tribunal on the ruins of the civil and common law, have modestly accepted, as the gift of Constantine, the independent jurisdiction which was the fruit of time, of accident, and of their own industry. But the liberality of the Christian emperors had actually endowed them with some legal prerogatives, which secured and dignified the sacerdotal character. Under a despotic government the bishops alone enjoyed and asserted the inestimable privilege of being tried only by their peers, and even in a capital accusation a synod of their brethren were the sole judges of their guilt or innocence. Such a tribunal, unless it was inflamed by personal resentment or religious discord, might be favourable or even partial to the sacerdotal order, but Constantine was satisfied that secret impunity would be less pernicious than public scandal, and the Nicene Council was edited by his public declaration that if he surprised a bishop in the act of adultery, he should cast his imperial mantle over the episcopal sinner. The domestic jurisdiction of the bishops was at once a privilege and a restraint of the ecclesiastical order, whose civil causes were decently withdrawn from the cognizance of a secular judge. The venial offences were not exposed to the shame of a public trial or punishment, and the gentle correction which the tenderness of youth may endure from its parents or instructors was inflicted by the temperate severity of the bishops. But if the clergy were guilty of any crime which could not be sufficiently expiated, by their degradation from an honourable and beneficial profession, the Roman magistrate drew the sword of justice, without any regard to ecclesiastical immunities. The arbitration of the bishops was ratified by a positive law, and the judges were instructed to execute, without appeal or delay, the episcopal decrees whose validity had hitherto depended on the consent of the parties. The conversion of the magistrates themselves, and of the whole empire, might gradually remove the fears and scruples of the Christians. But they still resorted to the tribunal of the bishops, whose abilities and integrity they esteemed, and the venerable Austin enjoyed the satisfaction of complaining that his spiritual functions were perpetually interrupted by the invidious labour of deciding the claim or the possession of silver and gold, of lands and cattle. The ancient privilege of sanctuary was transferred to the Christian temples, and extended by the liberal piety of the younger Theodosius to the precincts of consecrated ground. The fugitive and even guilty suppliants were permitted to implore either the justice or the mercy of the deity and his ministers. The rash violence of despotism was suspended by the mild interposition of the church, and the lives or fortunes of the most eminent subjects might be protected by the mediation of the bishop. 5. The bishop was the perpetual censor of the morals of his people. The discipline of penance was digested into a system of canonical jurisprudence, which accurately defined the duty of private or public confession, the rules of evidence, the degrees of guilt, and the measure of punishment. It was impossible to execute this spiritual censure if the Christian pontiff, who punished the obscure sins of the multitude, respected the conspicuous vices and destructive crimes of the magistrate, but it was impossible to arraign the conduct of the magistrate without controlling the administration of civil government. Some considerations of religion, or loyalty, or fear, protected the sacred persons of the emperors from the zeal or resentment of the bishops, but they boldly censured and excommunicated the subordinate tyrants who were not invested with the majesty of the purple. Saint Athanasius excommunicated one of the ministers of Egypt, and the interdict, which he pronounced, of fire and water, was solemnly transmitted to the churches of Cappadocia. Under the reign of the younger Theodosius, the polite and eloquent Synesius, one of the descendants of Hercules, filled the episcopal seat of Ptolemaeus, near the ruins of ancient Cyrene, and the philosophic bishop supported with dignity the character which he had assumed with reluctance.
he vanquished the monster of libya the president and dronicus who abused the authority of a venal office invented new modes of rapine and torture and aggravated the guilt of oppression by that of sacrilege after a fruitless attempt to reclaim the haughty magistrate by mild and religious admonition synesius proceeds to inflict the last sentence of ecclesiastical justice which devotes andronicus with his associates and their families to the abhorrence of earth and heaven the impenitent sinners more cruel than phalaris and sennacherib more destructive than war pestilence or a crowd of locusts are deprived of the name and privileges of christians of the participation of the sacraments and of the hope of paradise the bishop exhorts the clergy the magistrates and the people to renounce all society with the enemies of christ to exclude them from their houses and tables and to refuse them the common offices of life and the decent rites of burial the church of ptolemais obscure and contemptible as she may appear addresses this declaration to all her sister churches in the world and the profane who reject her decrees will be involved in the guilt and punishment of andronicus and his impious followers these spiritual terrors were enforced by a dexterous application to the byzantine court the trembling president implored the mercy of the church and the descendants of hercules enjoyed the satisfaction of raising a prostrate tyrant from the ground such principles and such examples insensibly prepared the triumph of the roman pontiffs who have trampled on the necks of kings six every popular government has experienced the effects of rude or artificial eloquence the coldest nature is animated the firmest reason is moved by the rapid communication of the prevailing impulse and each hearer is affected by his own passions and by those of the surrounding multitude the ruin of civil liberty had silenced the demagogues of athens and the tribunes of rome the custom of preaching which seems to constitute a considerable part of christian devotion had not been introduced into the temples of antiquity and the ears of monarchs were never invaded by the harsh sound of popular eloquence till the pulpits of the empire were filled with sacred orators who possessed some advantages unknown to their profane predecessors the arguments and rhetoric of the tribune were instantly opposed with equal arms by skilful and resolute antagonists and the cause of truth and reason might derive an accidental support from the conflict of hostile passions the bishop or some distinguished presbyter to whom he cautiously delegated the powers of preaching harangued without the danger of interruption or reply a submissive multitude whose minds had been prepared and subdued by the awful ceremonies of religion such was the strict subordination of the catholic church that the same consecrated sounds might issue at once from a hundred pulpits of italy or egypt if they were tuned by the master hand of the roman or alexandrian primate the design of this institution was laudable but the fruits were not always salutary the preachers recommended the practice of the social duties but they exalted the perfection of monastic virtue which is painful to the individual and useless to mankind their charitable exhortations betrayed a secret wish that the clergy might be permitted to manage the wealth of the faithful for the benefit of the poor the most sublime representations of the attributes and laws of the deity were sullied by an idle mixture of metaphysical subtleties puerile rites and fictitious miracles and they expatiated with the most fervent zeal on the religious merit of hating the adversaries and obeying the ministers of the church when the public peace was distracted by heresy and schism the sacred orators sounded the trumpet of discord and perhaps of sedition the understandings of their congregations were perplexed by mystery their passions were inflamed by invectives and they rushed from the christian temples of antioch or alexandria prepared either to suffer or to inflict martyrdom the corruption of taste and language is strongly marked in the vehement declamations of the latin bishops but the compositions of gregory and chrysostom have been compared with the most splendid models of attic or at least of asiatic eloquence seven the representatives of the christian republic were regularly assembled in the spring and autumn of each year 
and these synods diffused the spirit of ecclesiastical discipline and legislation through the hundred and twenty provinces of the Roman world. The archbishop or metropolitan was empowered by the laws to summon the suffragan bishops of his province, to revise their conduct, to vindicate their rights, to declare their faith, and to examine the merits of the candidates who were elected by the clergy and people, to supply the vacancies of the Episcopal College. The primates of Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, Carthage, and afterwards Constantinople, who exercised a more ample jurisdiction, convened the numerous assembly of their dependent bishops. But the convocation of great and extraordinary synods was the prerogative of the emperor alone. Whenever the emergencies of the church required this decisive measure, he dispatched a peremptory summons to the bishops, or the deputies of each province, with an order for the use of post-horses, and a competent allowance for the expenses of their journey. At an early period, when Constantine was the protector rather than the proselyte of Christianity, he referred the African controversy to the Council of Arles, in which the bishops of York, of Treves, of Milan, and of Carthage met as friends and brethren to debate in their native tongue on the common interest of the Latin or Western Church. Eleven years afterwards, a more numerous and celebrated assembly was convened at Nice in Bithynia to extinguish by their final sentence the subtle disputes which had arisen in Egypt on the subject of the Trinity. Three hundred and eighteen bishops obeyed the summons of their indulgent master. The ecclesiastics of every rank and sect and denomination have been computed at two thousand and forty-eight persons. The Greeks appeared in person, and the consent of the Latins was expressed by the legates of the Roman pontiff. The session, which lasted about two months, was frequently honoured by the presence of the emperor. Leaving his guards at the door, he seated himself, with the permission of the council, on a low stool in the midst of the hall. Constantine listened with patience and spoke with modesty, and while he influenced the debates, he humbly professed that he was the minister, not the judge, of the successors of the apostles, who had been established as priests and as gods upon earth. Such profound reverence of an absolute monarch towards a feeble and unarmed assembly of his own subjects can only be compared to the respect with which the Senate had been treated by the Roman princes who adopted the policy of Augustus. Within the space of fifty years, a philosophic spectator of the vicissitude of human affairs might have contemplated Tacitus in the Senate of Rome and Constantine in the Council of Nice. The fathers of the capital and those of the church had alike degenerated from the virtues of their founders, but as the bishops were more deeply rooted in the public opinion, they sustained their dignity with more decent pride, and sometimes opposed, with a manly spirit, the wishes of their sovereign. The progress of time and superstition erased the memory of the weakness, the passion, the ignorance, which disgraced these ecclesiastical synods, and the Catholic world has unanimously submitted to the infallible decrees of the general councils. End of chapter 20, part 4「Chapter 21, Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Anaya. Chapter 21. Persecution of Heresy, State of the Church. Part 1. Persecution of Heresy. The Schism of the Donatists, The Arian Controversy, Athanasius, Distracted State of the Church and Empire under Constantine and his Sons, Toleration of Paganism. The grateful applause of the clergy has consecrated the memory of a prince who indulged their passions and promoted their interest. Constantine gave them security, wealth, honors, and revenge and the support of the Orthodox faith was considered as the most sacred and important duty of the civil magistrate. The Edict of Milan, the Great Charter of Toleration, 
had confirmed to each individual of the Roman world the privilege of choosing and professing his own religion. But this inestimable privilege was soon violated with the knowledge of truth. The emperor imbibed the maxims of persecution, and the sects which dissented from the Catholic Church were afflicted and oppressed by the triumph of Christianity. Constantine easily believed that the heretics, who presumed to dispute his opinions or to oppose his commands, were guilty of the most absurd and criminal obstinacy, and that a seasonable application of moderate severities might save those unhappy men from the danger of an everlasting condemnation. Not a moment was lost in excluding the ministers and teachers of the separated congregations from any share of the rewards and immunities which the emperor had so liberally bestowed on the orthodox clergy. But as the sectaries might still exist under the cloud of royal disgrace, the conquest of the East was immediately followed by an edict which announced their total destruction. After a preamble filled with passion and reproach, Constantine absolutely prohibits the assemblies of the heretics and confiscates their public property to the use either of the revenue or of the Catholic Church. The sects against whom the imperial severity was directed appear to have been the adherents of Paul of Samosata, the Montanists of Phrygia, who maintained an enthusiastic succession of prophecy, the Novatians, who sternly rejected the temporal efficacy of repentance, the Martianites and Valentinians, under whose leading banners the various Gnostics of Asia and Egypt had insensibly rallied, and perhaps the Manichaeans, who had recently imported from Persia a more artful composition of Oriental and Christian theology. The design of extirpating the name, or at least of restraining the progress of these odious heretics, was prosecuted with vigor and effect. Some of the penal regulations were copied from the edicts of Diocletian, and this method of conversion was applauded by the same bishops who had felt the hand of oppression and pleaded for the rights of humanity. Two immaterial circumstances may serve, however, to prove that the mind of Constantine was not entirely corrupted by the spirit of zeal and bigotry. Before he condemned the Manichaeans and their kindred sects, he resolved to make an accurate inquiry into the nature of their religious principles. As if he distrusted the impartiality of his ecclesiastical counselors, this delicate commission was entrusted to a civil magistrate, whose learning and moderation he justly esteemed, and of whose venal character he was probably ignorant. The emperor was soon convinced that he had too hastily proscribed the orthodox faith and the exemplary morals of the Novatians, who had dissented from the church in some articles of discipline which were not perhaps essential to salvation. By a particular edict, he exempted them from the general penalties of the law, allowed them to build a church at Constantinople, respected the miracles of their saints, invited their bishop Assisius to the Council of Nice, and gently ridiculed the narrow tenets of his sect by familiar jest, which from the mouth of a sovereign must have been received with applause and gratitude. The complaints and mutual accusations which assailed the throne of Constantine as soon as the death of Maxentius had submitted Africa to his victorious arms were ill-adapted to edify an imperfect proselyte. He learned, with surprise, that the provinces of that great country, from the confines of Cyrene to the columns of Hercules, were distracted with religious discord. The source of the division was derived from a double election in the Church of Carthage, the second in rank and opulence of the ecclesiastical thrones of the West. Sicilian and Majoranus were the two rival prelates of Africa, and the death of the latter soon made room for Donatus, who, by his superior abilities and apparent virtues, was the firmest support of his party. The advantage which Sicilian might claim from the priority of his ordination was destroyed by the illegal, or at least indecent, haste with which it had been performed, without expecting the arrival of the bishops of Numidia. The authority of these bishops, who, to the number of seventy, condemned Sicilian and consecrated Majoranus, is again weakened by the infamy of some of their personal characters, and by the female intrigues, sacrilegious bargains, and tumultuous proceedings which are imputed to this Numidian council. The bishops of the contending factions maintained, with equal ardor and obstinacy, that their adversaries were degraded, or at least dishonored, by the odious crime of delivering the holy scriptures to the officers of Diocletian.
From their mutual reproaches, as well as from the story of this dark transaction, it may justly be inferred that the late persecution had embittered the zeal without reforming the manners of the African Christians. That divided church was incapable of affording an impartial judicature. The controversy was solemnly tried in five successive tribunals, which were appointed by the emperor, and the whole proceeding, from the first appeal to the final sentence, lasted above three years. A severe inquisition, which was taken by the Praetorian vicar and the proconsul of Africa, the report of two episcopal visitors who had been sent to Carthage, the decrees of the councils of Rome and of Arles, and the supreme judgment of Constantine himself in his sacred consistory, were all favorable to the cause of Sicilian, and he was unanimously acknowledged by the civil and ecclesiastical powers as the true and lawful primate of Africa. The honors and estates of the church were attributed to his suffragan bishops, and it was not without difficulty that Constantine was satisfied with inflicting the punishment of exile on the principal leaders of the Donatist faction. As their cause was examined with attention, perhaps it was determined with justice. Perhaps their complaint was not without foundation that the credulity of the emperor had been abused by the insidious art of his favorite Osius. The influence of falsehood and corruption might procure the condemnation of the innocent or aggravate the sentence of the guilty. Such an act, however, of injustice, if it concluded an importunate dispute, might be numbered among the transient evils of a despotic administration, which are neither felt nor remembered by posterity. But this incident, so inconsiderable that it scarcely deserves a place in history, was productive of a memorable schism which afflicted the provinces of Africa above 300 years, and was extinguished only with Christianity itself. The inflexible zeal of freedom and fanaticism animated the Donatists to refuse obedience to the usurpers, whose election they disputed, and whose spiritual powers they denied. Excluded from the civil and religious communion of mankind, they boldly excommunicated the rest of mankind, who had embraced the impious party of Sicilian and of the Traditors, from whom he derived his pretended ordination. They asserted with confidence, and almost with exultation, that the apostolical succession was interrupted, that all the bishops of Europe and Asia were infected by the contagion of guilt and schism, and that the prerogatives of the Catholic Church were confined to the chosen portion of the African believers, who alone had preserved inviolate the integrity of their faith and discipline. This rigid theory was supported by the most uncharitable conduct. Whenever they acquired a proselyte, even from the distant provinces of the East, they carefully repeated the sacred rites of baptism and ordination, as they rejected the validity of those which he had already received from the hands of heretics or schismatics. Bishops, virgins, and even spotless infants were subjected to the disgrace of a public penance, before they could be admitted to the communion of the Donatists. If they obtained possession of a church which had been used by their Catholic adversaries, they purified the unhallowed building with the same zealous care which a temple of idols might have required. They washed the pavement, scraped the walls, burnt the altar, which was commonly made of wood, melted the consecrated plate, and cast the Holy Eucharist to the dogs, with every circumstance of ignominy which could provoke and perpetuate the animosity of religious factions. Notwithstanding this irreconcilable aversion, the two parties, who were mixed and separated in all the cities of Africa, had the same language and manners, the same zeal and learning, the same faith and worship. Proscribed by the civil and ecclesiastical powers of the empire, the Donatists still maintained in some provinces, particularly in Numidia, their superior numbers, and 400 bishops acknowledged the jurisdiction of their primate. But the invincible spirit of the sect sometimes preyed on its own vitals, and the bosom of their schismatical church was torn by intestine divisions. A fourth part of the Donatist bishops followed the independent standard of the Maximianists. The narrow and solitary path which their first leaders had marked out continued to deviate from the great society of mankind. Even the imperceptible sect of the Rogations could affirm, without a blush, that when Christ should descend to judge the earth, he would find his true religion preserved only in a few nameless villages of the Caesarean Mauritania. The schism of the Donatists was confined to Africa, 
the more diffusive mischief of the Trinitarian controversy successively penetrated into every part of the Christian world. The former was an accidental quarrel, occasioned by the abuse of freedom. The latter was a high and mysterious argument, derived from the abuse of philosophy. From the age of Constantine to that of Clovis and Theodoric, the temporal interests of both of the Romans and barbarians were deeply involved in the theological disputes of Arianism. The historian may therefore be permitted respectfully to withdraw the veil of sanctuary and to deduce the progress of reason and faith, of error and passion, from the school of Plato to the decline and fall of the empire. The genius of Plato, informed by his own meditation or by the traditional knowledge of the priests of Egypt, had ventured to explore the mysterious nature of the deity. When he had elevated his mind to the sublime contemplation of the first self-existent necessary cause of the universe, the Athenian sage was incapable of conceiving how the simple unity of his essence could admit the infinite variety of distinct and successive ideas which compose the model of the intellectual world, how a being purely incorporeal could execute that perfect model and mold with a plastic hand the rude and independent chaos. The vain hope of extricating himself from these difficulties, which must ever oppress the feeble powers of the human mind, might induce Plato to consider the divine nature under the threefold modification of the first cause, the reason, or the logos, and the soul or spirit of the universe. His poetical imagination sometimes fixed and animated these metaphysical abstractions. The three archical on original principles were represented in the Platonic system as three gods, united with each other by a mysterious and ineffable generation, and the Logos was particularly considered under the more accessible character of the son of an eternal father and the creator and governor of the world. Such appear to have been the secret doctrines which were cautiously whispered in the gardens of the academy, and which, according to the more recent disciples of Plato, could not be perfectly understood till after an assiduous study of thirty years. The arms of the Macedonians diffused over Asia and Egypt the language and learning of Greece, and the theological system of Plato was taught, with less reserve, and perhaps with some improvements, in the celebrated school of Alexandria. A numerous colony of Jews had been invited, by the favor of the Ptolemies, to settle in their new capital. While the bulk of the nation practiced the legal ceremonies and pursued the lucrative occupations of commerce, a few Hebrews, of a more liberal spirit, devoted their lives to religious and philosophical contemplation. They cultivated with diligence and embraced with ardor the theological system of the Athenian sage. But their national pride would have been mortified by a fair confession of their former poverty, and they boldly marked, as the sacred inheritance of their ancestors, the gold and jewels which they had so lately stolen from their Egyptian masters. One hundred years before the birth of Christ, a philosophical treatise, which manifestly betrays the style and sentiments of the school of Plato, was produced by the Alexandrian Jews and unanimously received as a genuine and valuable relic of the inspired wisdom of Solomon. A similar union of the Mosaic faith and the Grecian philosophy distinguishes the works of Philo, which were composed, for the most part, under the reign of Augustus. The material soul of the universe might offend the piety of the Hebrews, but they applied the character of the Logos to the Jehovah of Moses and the Patriarchs, and the Son of God was introduced upon earth under a visible and even human appearance, to perform those familiar offices which seem incompatible with the nature and attributes of the universal cause. End of chapter 21, part 1. Recording by Daniel Anaya. Chapter 21, Part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Anaya. The Eloquence of Plato, the Name of Solomon, the Authority of the School of Alexandria, and the Consent of the Jews and Greeks were insufficient to establish the truth of a mysterious doctrine which might please, but could not satisfy, a rational mind. A prophet or apostle, inspired by the deity, can alone exercise a lawful dominion over the faith of mankind, and the theology of Plato might have been forever confounded 
with the philosophical visions of the Academy, the Porch, and the Lyceum if the name and divine attributes of the Logos had not been confirmed by the celestial pen of the last and most sublime of the evangelists. The Christian revelation, which was consummated under the reign of Nerva, disclosed to the world the amazing secret that the Logos, who was with God from the beginning and was God, who had made all things and for whom all things had been made, was incarnate in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who had been born of a virgin and suffered death on the cross. Besides the general design of fixing on a perpetual basis the divine honors of Christ, the most ancient and respectable of the ecclesiastical writers have ascribed to the evangelic theologian a particular intention to confute two opposite heresies, which disturbed the peace of the primitive church. 1. The faith of the Ebionites, perhaps of the Nazarenes, was gross and imperfect. They revered Jesus as the greatest of the prophets, endowed with supernatural virtue and power. They ascribed to his person and to his future reign all the predictions of the Hebrew oracles which relate to the spiritual and everlasting kingdom of the promised Messiah. Some of them might confess that he was born of a virgin, but they obstinately rejected the preceding existence and divine perfections of the Logos, or Son of God, which are so clearly defined in the Gospel of St. John. About fifty years afterwards, the Ebionites, whose errors are mentioned by Justin Martyr with less severity than they seem to deserve, formed a very inconsiderable portion of the Christian name. 2. The Gnostics, who were distinguished by the epithet of Docetes, deviated into the contrary extreme and betrayed the human while they asserted the divine nature of Christ. Educated in the school of Plato, accustomed to the sublime idea of the Logos, they readily conceived that the brightest eon, or emanation of the deity, might assume the outward shape and visible appearances of a mortal, but they vainly pretended that the imperfections of matter are incompatible with the purity of a celestial substance. While the blood of Christ yet smoked on Mount Calvary, the Docetes invented the impious and extravagant hypothesis that instead of issuing from the womb of the Virgin, he had descended on the banks of the Jordan in the form of perfect manhood, that he had imposed on the senses of his enemies and of his disciples, and that the ministers of Pilate had wasted their impotent rage on an airy phantom who seemed to expire on the cross and, after three days, to rise from the dead. The divine sanction which the Apostle had bestowed on the fundamental principle of the theology of Plato encouraged the learned proselytes of the second and third centuries to admire and study the writings of the Athenian sage, who had thus marvelously anticipated one of the most surprising discoveries of the Christian revelation. The respectable name of Plato was used by the Orthodox and abused by the heretics as the common support of truth and error. The authority of his skillful commentators and the science of dialectics were employed to justify the remote consequences of his opinions and to supply the discreet silence of the inspired writers. The same subtle and profound questions concerning the nature, the generation, the distinction, and the equality of the three divine persons of the mysterious triad or trinity were agitated in the philosophical and in the Christian schools of Alexandria. An eager spirit of curiosity urged them to explore the secrets of the abyss, and the pride of the professors and of their disciples was satisfied with the sciences of words. But the most sagacious of the Christian theologians, the great Athanasius himself, has candidly confessed that whenever he forced his understanding to meditate on the divinity of the Logos, his toilsome and unavailing efforts recoiled on themselves, that the more he thought, the less he comprehended, and the more he wrote, the less capable was he of expressing his thoughts. In every step of the inquiry, we are compelled to feel and acknowledge the immeasurable disproportion between the size of the object and the capacity of the human mind. We may strive to abstract the notions of time, of space, and of matter, which so closely adhere to all the perceptions of our experimental knowledge, but as soon as we presume to reason of infinite substance, of spiritual generation, as often as we deduce any positive conclusions from a negative idea, we are involved in darkness, perplexity, and inevitable contradiction. As these difficulties arise from the nature of the subject, they oppress, with the same insuperable weight, the philosophic and the theological disputant, 
but we may observe two essential and peculiar circumstances which discriminated the doctrines of the Catholic Church from the opinions of the Platonic school. 1. A chosen society of philosophers, men of a liberal education and curious disposition, might silently meditate and temperately discuss in the gardens of Athens or the library of Alexandria the abstruse questions of metaphysical science. The lofty speculations, which neither convinced the understanding nor agitated the passions of the Platonists themselves, were carelessly overlooked by the idle, the busy, and even the studious part of mankind. But after the Logos had been revealed as the sacred object of the faith, the hope, and the religious worship of the Christians, the mysterious system was embraced by a numerous and increasing multitude in every province of the Roman world. Those persons who, from their age or sex or occupations, were the least qualified to judge, who were the least exercised in the habits of abstract reasoning, aspired to contemplate the economy of the divine nature. And it is the boast of Tertullian that a Christian mechanic could readily answer such questions as had perplexed the wisest of the Grecian sages. Where the subject lies so far beyond our reach, the difference between the highest and the lowest of human understandings may indeed be calculated as infinitely small. Yet the degree of weakness may perhaps be measured by the degree of obstinacy and dogmatic confidence. These speculations, instead of being treated as the amusement of a vacant hour, became the most serious business of the present and the most useful preparation for a future life. A theology, which it was incumbent to believe, which it was impious to doubt, and which it might be dangerous and even fatal to mistake, became the familiar topic of private meditation and popular discourse. The cold indifference of philosophy was inflamed by the fervent spirit of devotion, and even the metaphors of common language suggested the fallacious prejudices of sense and experience. The Christians, who abhorred the gross and impure generation of the Greek mythology, were tempted to argue from the familiar analogy of the filial and paternal relations. The character of son seemed to imply a perpetual subordination to the voluntary author of his existence, but as the act of generation, in the most spiritual and abstracted sense, must be supposed to transmit the properties of a common nature, they durst not presume to circumscribe the powers or the duration of the Son of an eternal and omnipotent Father. Fourscore years after the death of Christ, the Christians of Bithynia declared before the tribunal of Pliny that they invoked him as a god, and his divine honors have been perpetuated in every age and country by the various sects who assume the name of his disciples. Their tender reverence for the memory of Christ and their horror for the profane worship of any created being would have engaged them to assert the equal and absolute divinity of the Logos if their rapid ascent towards the throne of heaven had not been imperceptibly checked by the apprehension of violating the unity and sole supremacy of the great Father of Christ and of the universe. The suspense and fluctuation produced in the minds of the Christians by these opposite tendencies may be observed in the writings of the theologians who flourished after the end of the apostolic age and before the origin of the Arian controversy. Their suffrage is claimed with equal confidence by the orthodox and by the heretical parties, and the most inquisitive critics have fairly allowed that if they have the good fortune of possessing the Catholic verity, they have delivered their conceptions in loose, inaccurate, and sometimes contradictory language. End of chapter 21, part 2. Recording by Daniel Anaya. 21, part 3 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 2, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 21. Persecution of Heresy and the State of the Church. Part 3. The devotion of individuals was the first circumstance which distinguished the Christians from the Platonists. The second was the authority of the Church. The disciples of philosophy asserted the rights of intellectual freedom, and their respect for the sentiments of their teachers was a liberal and voluntary tribute, which they offered to superior reason. But the Christians formed a numerous and disciplined society, 
and the jurisdiction of their laws and magistrates was strictly exercised over the minds of the faithful. The loose wanderings of the imagination were gradually confined by creeds and confessions. The freedom of private judgment submitted to the public wisdom of synods. The authority of a theologian was determined by his ecclesiastical rank, and the episcopal successors of the apostles inflicted the censures of the church on those who deviated from orthodox belief. But in an age of religious controversy, every act of oppression adds new force to the elastic vigor of the mind, and the zeal or obstinacy of a spiritual rebel was sometimes stimulated by secret motives of ambition or avarice. A metaphysical argument became the cause or pretense of political contests. The subtleties of the Platonic school were used as the badges of popular factions, and the distance which separated their respective tenets were enlarged or magnified by the acrimony of dispute. As long as the dark heresies of Praxius and Sibelius labored to confound the father with the son, the orthodox party might be excused if they adhered more strictly and more earnestly to the distinction than to the equality of the divine persons. But as soon as the heat of controversy had subsided, and the progress of the Sibelians was no longer an object of terror to the churches of Rome, of Africa, or of Egypt, the tide of theological opinion began to flow with a gentle but steady motion toward the contrary extreme and the most orthodox doctors allowed themselves the use of the terms and definitions which had been censured in the mouth of those sectaries. After the edict of toleration had restored peace and leisure to the Christians, the Trinitarian controversy was revived in the ancient seat of Platonism, the learned, the opulent, the tumultuous city of Alexandria, and the flame of religious discord was rapidly communicated from the schools to the clergy, the people, the province, and the East. The abstruse question of the eternity of the Logos was agitated in ecclesiastic conferences and popular sermons, and the heterodox opinions of Arius were soon made public by his own zeal, and by that of his adversaries. His most implacable adversaries have acknowledged the learning and the blameless life of that eminent presbyter, who in a former election had declared, and perhaps generously declined, his pretensions to the episcopal throne. His competitor, Alexander, assumed the office of his judge. The important cause was argued before him, and if at first he seemed to hesitate, he at length pronounced his final sentence, as an absolute rule of faith. The undaunted presbyter, who presumed to resist the authority of his angry bishop, was separated from the community of the church. But the pride of Arius was supported by the applause of a numerous party. He reckoned among his immediate followers two bishops of Egypt, seven presbyters, twelve deacons, and, what may appear almost incredible, seven hundred virgins. A large majority of the bishops of Asia appeared to support or favor his cause, and their measures were conducted by Eusebius of Caesarea, the most learned of the Christian prelates, and by Eusebius of Nicomedia, who had acquired the reputation of a statesman without forfeiting that of a saint. Synods in Palestine and Bithynia were opposed to the synods of Egypt. The attention of the prince and people was attracted by this theological dispute, and the decision, at the end of six years, was referred to the supreme authority of the General Council of Nicaea. When the mysteries of the Christian faith were dangerously exposed to public debate, it might be observed that the human understanding was capable of forming three distinct, though imperfect, systems concerning the nature of the divine trinity, and it was pronounced that none of these systems, in a pure and absolute sense, were exempt from heresy and error. 1. According to the first hypothesis, which was maintained by Arius and his disciples, the Logos was a dependent and spontaneous production, created from nothing by the will of the Father. The Son, whom all things were made, had been begotten before all worlds, and the longest of the astronomical periods could be compared only as a fleeting moment to the extent of his duration. Yet this duration was not infinite, and there had been a time which preceded the ineffable generation of the Logos. On this only begotten Son the Almighty Father had transfused his ample spirit, and impressed the effulgence of his glory. Visible image of invisible perfection, he saw, at an immeasurable distance beneath his feet, the thrones of brightest archangels, yet he shone only with reflected light, and like the sons of the Roman emperors, who were invested with the titles of Caesar or Augustus, he governed the universe in obedience with the will of his father and monarch. 
2. In the second hypothesis, the Logos possessed all the inherent incommunicable perfections which religion and philosophy appropriate to the Supreme God. Three distinct and infinite minds or substances, three co-equal and co-eternal beings, compose the divine essence, and it would have implied contradiction that any of them should not have existed, or that they should ever cease to exist. The advocates of a system which seemed to establish three independent deities attempted to preserve the unity of the first cause, so conspicuous in the design and order of the world, by the perpetual concord of their administration, and the essential agreement of their will. A faint resemblance of this unity of action may be discovered in societies of men and even of animals. The causes which disturb their harmony proceed only from the imperfection and inequality of their faculties, but the omnipotence which is guided by infinite wisdom and goodness cannot fail of choosing the same means for the accomplishment of the same ends. 3. Three beings, who, by the self-derived necessity of their existence, possess all the divine attributes in the most perfect degree, who are eternal in duration, infinite in space, and intimately present to each other and to the whole universe, irresistibly force themselves on the astonished mind as one and the same being, who in the economy of grace, as well in that of nature, may manifest himself under different forms, and be considered under different aspects. By this hypothesis, a real substantial trinity is refined into a trinity of names and abstract modifications that exist only in the mind which conceives them. The Logos is no longer a person but an attribute, and it is only in a figurative sense that the epithet of Son can be applied to the eternal reason, which was with God from the beginning, and by which, not by whom, all things were made. The incarnation of the Logos is reduced to a mere inspiration of divine wisdom, which filled the soul and directed the actions of the man Jesus. Thus, after revolving around the theological circle, we are surprised to find that the Sabellian ends where the Ebionite had begun, and that the incomprehensible mystery which excites our adoration eludes our inquiry. If the bishops of the Council of Nice had been permitted to follow the unbiased dictates of their conscience, Arius and his associates could scarcely have flattered themselves with the hope of obtaining a majority of votes in favor of a hypothesis so directly averse to the two most popular opinions of the Catholic world. The Arians soon perceived the danger of the situation, and prudently assumed those modest virtues which, in the fury of civil and religious dissensions, are seldom practiced or even praised except by the weaker party. They recommended the exercise of Christian charity and moderation, urged the incomprehensible nature of the controversy, disclaimed the use of any terms or definitions which could not be found in the scriptures, and offered, by very liberal concessions, to satisfy their adversaries without renouncing the integrity of their own principles. The victorious faction received all their proposals with haughty suspicion, and anxiously sought for some irreconcilable mark of distinction, the rejection of which might involve the Arians in the guilt and consequences of heresy. A letter was publicly read and ignominiously torn, in which their patron, Eusebius of Nicomedia, ingenuously confessed that the admission of the homoousion, or consubstantial, a word already familiar to Platonists, was incompatible with the principles of their theological system. The fortunate opportunity was eagerly embraced by the bishops, who governed the resolutions of the Synod, and according to the lively expression of Ambrose, they used the sword which heresy itself had drawn from the scabbard to cut off the head of the hated monster. The consubstantiality of the father and son was established by the Council of Nice, and has unanimously been received as a fundamental article of the Christian faith, by the consent of the Greek, the Latin, the Oriental, and the Protestant churches. But if the same word has not served to stigmatize the heretics and to unite the Catholics, it would have been inadequate to the purpose of the majority by whom it was introduced into the orthodox creed. This majority was divided into two parties, distinguished by a contrary tendency to the sentiments of the Tritheists and of the Sabellians. But as these opposite extremes seem to overthrow the foundations either of natural or revealed religion, they mutually agreed to qualify the rigor of their principles, and to disavow the just but invidious consequences which might be urged by their antagonists. The interest of the common cause inclined them to join their numbers, and to conceal their differences. Animosity was softened by the healing counsels of toleration, and their disputes were suspended by the use of the mysterious homoseon which either party was free to interpret according to their peculiar tenets. 
The Sabellian sense, which about fifty years before had obliged the Council of Antioch to prohibit this celebrated term, had endeared it to those theologians who entertained a secret but partial affection for a nominal trinity. But the more fashionable saints of the Arian times, the intrepid Athanasius, the learned Gregory Nazianzen, and the other pillars of the Church, who supported with ability and success the Nicene doctrine, appeared to consider the expression of substance as if it had been synonymous with that of nature, and they ventured to illustrate their meaning by affirming that three men, as they belong to the same common species, are consubstantial, or homoousian to each other. This pure and distinct equality was tempered, on the one hand, by the internal connection and spiritual penetration which indissolubly unites the divine persons, and on the other, by the preeminence of the Father, which was acknowledged as far as it is compatible with the independence of the Son. Within these limits the almost invisible and tremulous ball of orthodoxy was allowed securely to vibrate. On either side, beyond this consecrated ground, the heretics and the demons lurked in ambush to surprise and devour the unhappy wanderer. But as the degrees of theological hatred depend on the spirit of war, rather than on the importance of the controversy, the heretics who degraded were treated with more severity than those who annihilated the person of the sun. The life of Athanasius was consumed in irreconcilable opposition to the impious madness of the Arians, but he defended above twenty years the Sabellianism of Marcellus of Ancyra, and when at last he was compelled to withdraw himself from his communion, he continued to mention, with an ambiguous smile, the venial errors of his respectable friend. The authority of a general council, to which the Arians themselves had been compelled to submit, inscribed on the banners of the Orthodox party the mysterious characters of the word homoousion, which essentially contributed, notwithstanding some obscure disputes, some nocturnal combats, to maintain and perpetuate the uniformity of faith, or at least of language. The consubstantialists, who by their success have deserved and obtained the title of Catholics, gloried in the simplicity and steadiness of their own creed, and insulted the repeated variations of their adversaries, who were destitute of any certain rule of faith. The sincerity or the cunning of the Arian chiefs, the fear of the laws or of the people, their reverence for Christ, their hatred of Athanasius, all the causes, human and divine, that influence and disturb the counsels of a theological faction, introduced among the sectaries a spirit of discord and inconstancy, which in the course of a few years erected eighteen different models of religion, and avenged the violated dignity of the Church. The zealous Hilary, who from the peculiar hardships of his situation was inclined to extenuate rather than to aggravate the errors of the Oriental clergy, declares that, in the wide extent of the ten provinces of Asia to which he had been banished, there could be found very few prelates who had preserved the knowledge of the true God. The oppression which he had felt, the disorders of which he was the spectator and the victim, appeased, during a short interval, the angry passions of his soul, and in the following passage, of which I shall transcribe a few lines, the bishop of Poitiers unwarily deviates into the style of a Christian philosopher. It is a thing, says Hilary, equally deplorable and dangerous, that there are as many creeds as opinions among men, as many doctrines as inclinations, and as many sources of blasphemy as there are faults among us, because we make creeds arbitrarily, and explain them as arbitrarily. The homoousion is rejected and received and explained away by successive synods. The partial or total resemblance of the Father and of the Son is a subject of dispute for these unhappy times. Every year, nay, every moon, we make new creeds to describe invisible mysteries. We repent of what we have done, we defend those who repent, we anathematize those whom we defended, we condemn either the doctrine of others in ourselves, or our own in that of others, and reciprocally tearing one another to pieces, we have been the cause of each other's ruin." It will not be expected, it would not perhaps be endured, that I should swell this theological digression by a minute examination of the eighteen creeds, the authors of which for the most part disclaimed the odious name of their parent Arius. It is amusing enough to delineate the form, and to trace the vegetation of a singular plant, but the tedious detail of leaves without flowers and branches without fruit would soon exhaust the patience and disappoint the curiosity of the laborious student. One question, which gradually arose from the Arian controversy, may, however, be noticed, as it served to produce and discriminate the three sects, who were united only by their common aversion to the homoousion of the Nicene Synod. 
If they were asked whether the Son was like unto the Father, the question was resolutely answered in the negative by the heretics who adhered to the principles of Arius, or indeed to those of philosophy, which seemed to establish an infinite difference between the Creator and the most excellent of his creatures. This obvious consequence was maintained by Aetius, on whom the zeal of his adversaries bestowed the surname of the Atheist. His restless and aspiring spirit urged him to try almost every profession of human life. He was successively a slave, or at least a husbandman, a travelling tinker, a goldsmith, a physician, a schoolmaster, a theologian, and at last the apostle a new church, which was propagated by the abilities of his disciple Eunomius. Armed with texts of scripture and with captious syllogisms from the logic of Aristotle, the subtle Aetius had acquired the fame of an invincible disputant, whom it was impossible either to silence or to convince. Such talents engaged the friendship of the Arian bishops, till they were forced to renounce and even to persecute a dangerous ally who, by the accuracy of his reasoning, had prejudiced their cause in the popular opinion, and offended the piety of their most devoted followers. The omnipotence of the Creator suggested a specious and respectful solution of the likeness of the Father and the Son, and faith might humbly receive what reason could not presume to deny, that the Supreme God might communicate His infinite perfections, and create a being similar only to Himself. These Arians were powerfully supported by the weight and abilities of their leaders, who had succeeded to the management of the Eusebian interest, and who occupied the principal thrones of the East. They detested, perhaps with some affectation, the impiety of Aetius. They professed to believe, either without reserve or according to the scriptures, that the Son was different from all other creatures, and similar only to the Father. But they denied that he was either of the same or of a similar substance, sometimes boldly justifying their dissent, and sometimes objecting to the use of the word substance, which seems to imply an adequate, or at least a distinct, notion of the nature of the deity. The sect which deserted the doctrine of a similar substance was the most numerous, at least in the provinces of Asia, and when the leaders of both parties were assembled in the Council of Seleucia, their opinion would have prevailed by a majority of one hundred and five to forty-three bishops. The Greek word which was chosen to express this mysterious resemblance bears so close an affinity to the orthodox symbol, that the profane of every age have derided the furious contests which the difference of a single diphthong excited between the Homoousians and the Homoousians. As it frequently happens that the sounds and characters which approach the nearest to each other accidentally represent the most opposite ideas, the observation would itself be ridiculous, if it were possible to mark any real and sensible distinction between the dogma of the semi-Arians, as they were improperly styled, and that of the Catholics themselves. The Bishop of Poitiers, who in his Phrygian exile very wisely aimed at a coalition of parties, endeavours to prove that by a pious and faithful interpretation the homoiosion may be reduced to a consubstantial sense. Yet he confesses that the word has a dark and suspicious aspect, and, as if darkness were congenial to theological disputes, the semiarians who advanced to the doors of the church assailed them with the most unrelenting fury. The provinces of Egypt and Asia, which cultivated the language and manners of the Greeks, had deeply imbibed the venom of the Arian controversy. The familiar study of the Platonic system, a vain and argumentative disposition, a copious and flexible idiom, supplied the clergy and the people of the East with an inexhaustible flow of words and distinctions, and in the midst of their fierce contentions they easily forgot the doubt which is recommended by philosophy, and the submission which enjoined by religion. The inhabitants of the West were of a less inquisitive spirit. Their passions were not so forcibly moved by invisible objects. Their minds were less frequently exercised by the habits of dispute, and such was the happy ignorance of the Gallican Church, that Hilary himself, above thirty years after the first general council, was still a stranger to the Nicene Creed. The Latins had received the rays of divine knowledge through the dark and doubtful medium of a translation. The poverty and stubbornness of their native tongue was not always capable of affording just equivalents for the Greek terms, for the technical words of the Platonic philosophy, which had been consecrated, by the gospel or by the church, to express the mysteries of the Christian faith, and a verbal defect might introduce into the Latin theology a long train of error or perplexity. But as the western provincials had the good fortune of deriving their religion from an orthodox source, they preserved with steadiness the doctrine which they had accepted with docility, and when the Arian pestilence approached their frontiers, they were supplied with the seasonable preservative of the Homoousion, by the paternal care of the Roman pontiff. 
Their sentiments and their temper were displayed in the memorable synod of Rimini, which surpassed in numbers the Council of Nice, since it was composed of above four hundred bishops of Italy, Africa, Spain, Gaul, Britain, and Illyricum. From the first debates it appeared that only fourscore prelates adhered to the party, though they affected to anathematize the name and memory of Arius. This inferiority was compensated by the advantages of skill, of experience, and of discipline, and the minority was conducted by Valens and Eursacius, two bishops of Illyricum, who had spent their lives in the intrigues of courts and councils, and who had been trained under the Eusebian banner in the religious wars of the East. By their arguments and negotiations they embarrassed, they confounded, they at last deceived the honest simplicity of the Latin bishops, who suffered the palladium of the faith to be extorted from their hand by fraud and importunity, rather than by open violence. The Council of Rimini was not allowed to separate till the members had imprudently subscribed a captious creed, in which some expressions, susceptible of a heretical sense, were inserted in the room of the Homoceon. It was on this occasion that, according to Jerome, the world was surprised to find itself Arian. But the bishops of the Latin provinces had no sooner reached their respective dioceses than they discovered the mistake and repented of their weakness. The ignominious capitulation was rejected with disdain and abhorrence, and the Homosian standard, which had been shaken but not overthrown, was more firmly replanted in all the churches of the West. End of chapter 21, part 3《》Part Three of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Two, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Twenty One: Persecution of Heresy, State of the Church, Part Four. Such was the rise and progress, and such were the natural revolutions of such theological debates, and such were the natural revolutions of those theological disputes which disturbed the peace of Christianity under the reigns of Constantine and of his sons. But as those princes presumed to extend their despotism over the faith, as well as over the lives and fortunes of their subjects, the weight of their suffrage sometimes inclined the ecclesiastical balance, and the prerogatives of the King of Heaven were settled, or changed, or modified, in the cabinet of an earthly monarch. The unhappy spirit of discord which pervaded the provinces of the East interrupted the triumph of Constantine, but the emperor continued for some time to view, with cool and careless indifference, the object of the dispute. As he was yet ignorant of the difficulty of appeasing the quarrels of theologians, he addressed to the contending parties, to Alexander and to Arius, a moderating epistle which may be ascribed with far greater reason to the untutored sense of a soldier and statesman than to the dictates of any of his episcopal counsellors. He attributes the origin of the whole controversy to a trifling and subtle question, concerning an incomprehensible point of law, which was foolishly asked by the bishop, and imprudently resolved by the presbyter. He laments that the Christian people, who had the same God, the same religion, and the same worship, should be divided by such inconsiderable distinctions, and he seriously recommends to the clergy of Alexandria the example of the Greek philosophers, who could maintain their arguments without losing their temper, and assert their freedom without violating their friendship. The indifference and contempt of the sovereign would have been, perhaps, the most effectual method of silencing the dispute, if the popular current had been less rapid and impetuous, and if Constantine himself, in the midst of faction and fanaticism, could have preserved the calm possession of his own mind. But his ecclesiastical minister soon contrived to seduce the impartiality of the magistrate, and to awaken the zeal of the proselyte. He was provoked by the insults which had been offered to his statues. He was alarmed by the real as well as the imaginary magnitude of the spreading mischief, and he extinguished the hope of peace and toleration from the moment that he assembled three hundred bishops within the walls of the same palace. The presence of the monarch swelled the importance of the debate. His attention multiplied the arguments, and he exposed his person with a patient intrepidity which animated the valour of the combatants. Notwithstanding the applause which had been bestowed on the eloquence and sagacity of Constantine, a Roman general, whose religion might still be a subject of doubt, and whose mind had not been enlightened either by study or by inspiration, was indifferently qualified to discuss, in the Greek language, a metaphysical question, or an article of faith. But the credit of his favourite Osius, who appears to have presided in the council of Nicaea, might dispose the emperor in favour of the orthodox party, 
and a well-timed insinuation that the same Eusebius of Nicomedia, who now protected the heretic, had lately assisted the tyrant, might exasperate him against their adversaries. The Nicene Creed was ratified by Constantine, and his firm declaration that those who resisted the divine judgment of the Synod must prepare themselves for immediate exile, annihilated the murmurs of a feeble opposition, which, from seventeen, was almost instantly reduced to two protesting bishops. Eusebius of Caesarea yielded a reluctant and ambiguous consent to the Homoousion, and the wavering conduct of the Nicomedian Eusebius served only to delay about three months his disgrace and exile. The impious Arius was banished into one of the remote provinces of Illyricum. His person and disciples were branded by law with the odious name of Porphyrians. His writings were condemned to the flames, and a capital punishment was denounced against those in whose possession they should be found. The emperor had now imbibed the spirit of controversy, and the angry, sarcastic style of his edicts was designed to inspire his subjects with the hatred which he had conceived against the enemies of Christ. But, as if the conduct of the emperor had been guided by passion instead of principle, three years from the council of Nicaea were scarcely elapsed before he discovered some symptoms of mercy, and even of indulgence, towards the prescribed sect, which was secretly protected by his favorite sister. The exiles were recalled, and Eusebius, who gradually resumed his influence over the mind of Constantine, was restored to the episcopal throne from which he had been ignominiously degraded. Arius himself was treated by the whole court with the respect which would have been due to an innocent and oppressed man. His faith was approved by the Synod of Jerusalem, and the emperor seemed impatient to repair his injustice by issuing an absolute command that he should be solemnly admitted to communion in the cathedral of Constantinople. On the same day which had been fixed for the triumph of Arius, he expired, and the strange and horrid circumstances of his death might excite a suspicion that the orthodox saints had contributed more efficaciously than by their prayers to deliver the church from the most formidable of her enemies. The three principal leaders of the Catholics, Athanasius of Alexandria, Eustathius of Antioch, and Paul of Constantinople, were deposed on various accusations by the sentence of numerous councils, and were afterwards banished into distant provinces by the first of the Christian emperors who, in the last moments of his life, received the rites of baptism from the Arian bishop of Nicomedia. The ecclesiastical government of Constantine cannot be justified from the reproach of levity and weakness. But the credulous monarch, unskilled in the stratagems of theological warfare, might be deceived by the modest and specious professions of the heretics, whose sentiments he never perfectly understood. And while he protected Arius, and persecuted Athanasius, he still considered the Council of Nicaea as the bulwark of the Christian faith, and the peculiar glory of his own reign. The sons of Constantine must have been admitted from their childhood into the rank of catechumens, but they imitated, in the delay of their baptism, the example of their father. Like him, they presumed to pronounce their judgment on mysteries into which they have never been regularly initiated and the fate of the Trinitarian controversy depended, in great measure, on the sentiments of Constantius, who inherited the provinces of the East and acquired the possession of the whole empire. The Arian presbyter, or bishop, who had secreted for his use the testament of the deceased emperor, improved the fortunate occasion which had introduced him to the familiarity of a prince, whose public councils were always swayed by his domestic favorites. The eunuchs and slaves diffused the spiritual poison through the palace, and the dangerous infection was communicated by the female attendants to the guards, and by the empress to her unsuspicious husband. The partiality which Constantius always expressed toward the Eusebian faction was insensibly fortified by the dexterous management of their leaders, and his victory over the tyrant Magnentius increased his inclination as well as ability to employ the arms of power in the cause of Arianism. While the two armies were engaged in the plains of Mursa, and the fate of the two rivals depended on the chance of war, the son of Constantine passed the anxious moments in a church of the martyrs under the walls of the city. His spiritual comforter, Valens, the Arian bishop of the diocese, employed the most artful precautions to obtain such early intelligence as might secure either his favor or his escape. A secret chain of swift and trusty messengers informed him of the vicissitudes of the battle, and while the courtiers stood trembling around their affrighted master, Valens assured him that the Gallic legions gave way, and insinuated, with some presence of mind, that the glorious event had been revealed to him by an angel. The grateful emperor ascribed his success to the merits and intercession of the bishop of Mursa, whose faith had deserved the public and miraculous approbation of heaven. The Arians, who considered as their own the victory of Constantius, preferred his glory to that of his father.' 
Cyril, bishop of Jerusalem, immediately composed the description of a celestial cross encircled with a splendid rainbow, which during the festival of Pentecost, at about the third hour of the day, had appeared over the Mount of Olives to the edification of the devout pilgrims and the people of the holy city. The size of the meteor was gradually magnified, and the Arian historian has ventured to affirm that it was conspicuous to the two armies in the plains of Panania, and that the tyrant, who is purposely represented as an idolater, fled before the auspicious sign of orthodox Christianity. The sentiments of a judicious stranger, who has impartially considered the progress of civil or ecclesiastical discord, are always entitled to our notice, and a short passage of Ammianus, who served in the armies and studied the character of Constantius, is perhaps of more value than many pages of theological invectives. The Christian religion, which in itself, said the moderate historian, is plain and simple, he confounded by the dotage of superstition. Instead of reconciling the parties by the weight of his authority, he cherished and promulgated by verbal disputes the differences which his vain curiosity had excited. The highways were covered with troops of bishops, galloping from every side to the assemblies, which they call synods, and while they laboured to reduce the whole sect to their own particular opinions, the public establishment of the posts was almost ruined by their hasty and repeated journeys. Our more intimate knowledge of the ecclesiastical transactions of the reign of Constantius would furnish an ample commentary on this remarkable passage, which justifies the rational apprehensions of Athanasius, that the restless activity of the clergy, who wandered round the empire in search of the true faith, would excite the contempt and laughter of the unbelieving world. As soon as the emperor was relieved from the terrors of the civil war, he devoted the leisure of his winter quarters at Arles, Milan, Sirmium, and Constantinople to the amusement or toils of controversy. The sword of the magistrate, and even of the tyrant, was unsheathed, to enforce the reasons of the theologian, and as he opposed the orthodox faith of Nicaea, it is readily confessed that his incapacity and ignorance were equal to his presumption. The eunuchs, the women, and the bishops, who governed the vain and feeble mind of the emperor, had inspired him with an insuperable dislike to the homoseon, but his timid conscience was alarmed by the impiety of Aetius. The guilt of that atheist was aggravated by the suspicious favour of the unfortunate Gallus, and even the death of the imperial ministers who had been massacred at Antioch were imputed to the suggestions of that dangerous sophist. The mind of Constantius, which could neither be moderated by reason nor fixed by faith, was blindly impelled to either side of the dark and empty abyss, by his horror of the opposite extreme. He alternately embraced and condemned the sentiments. He successively banished and recalled the leaders of the Arian and semi-Arian factions. During the season of public business or festivity, he employed whole days and even nights in selecting the words and weighing the syllables which composed his fluctuating creeds. The subject of his meditations still pursued and occupied his slumbers. The incoherent dreams of the emperor were received as celestial visions, and he accepted with complacency the lofty title of Bishop of Bishops, from those ecclesiastics who forgot the interest of their order for the gratification of their passions. The design of establishing a uniformity of doctrine, which had engaged him to convene so many synods in Gaul, Italy, Illyricum, and Asia, was repeatedly baffled by his own levity, by the division of the Arians, and by the resistance of the Catholics, and he resolved, as the last and decisive effort, imperiously to dictate the decrees of a general council. The destructive earthquake of Nicomedia, the difficulty of finding a convenient place, and perhaps some secret motives of policy, produced an alteration in the summons. The bishops of the East were directed to meet at Seleucia in Isauria, while those of the West held their deliberations at Rimini, on the coast of the Hadriatic, and instead of two or three deputies from each province, the whole episcopal body was ordered to march. The Eastern Council, after consuming four days in fierce and unavailing debate, separated without any definitive conclusion. The Council of the West was protracted till the seventh month. Taurus, the Praetorian prefect, was instructed not to dismiss the prelates till they should all be united in the same opinion, and his efforts were supported by the power of banishing fifteen of the most refractory, and a promise of the consulship if he achieved so difficult an adventure. His prayers and threats, the authority of the sovereign, the sophistry of Valens and Ursasius, the distress of the cold and hunger, and the tedious melancholy of a hopeless exile, at length extorted the reluctant consent of the bishops of Rimini. The deputies of the East and of the West attended the Emperor in the palace of Constantinople, and he enjoyed the satisfaction of imposing on the world a profession of faith which established the likeness, without expressing the consubstantiality, of the Son of God. <laughs>
but the triumph of Arianism had been preceded by the removal of the Orthodox clergy, whom it was impossible either to intimidate or to corrupt, and the reign of Constantius was disgraced by the unjust and ineffectual persecution of the great Athanasius. We have seldom an opportunity of observing, either in active or speculative life, what effect may be produced, or what obstacles may be surmounted, by the force of a single mind, when it is inflexibly applied to the pursuit of a single object. The immortal name of Athanasius will never be separated from the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity, to whose defense he consecrated every moment and every faculty of his being. Educated in the family of Alexander, he had vigorously opposed the early progress of the Arian heresy. He exercised the important functions of secretary under the aged prelate, and the fathers of the Nicene Council beheld with surprise and respect the rising virtues of the young deacon. In a time of public danger, the dull claims of age and rank are sometimes superseded, and within five months after his return from Nicaea, the deacon Athanasius was seated on the archiepiscopal throne of Egypt. He filled that eminent station above forty-six years, and his long administration was spent in a perpetual combat against the powers of Arianism. Five times was Athanasius expelled from his throne. Twenty years he passed as an exile or fugitive, and almost every province of the Roman Empire was successively witness to his merit, and his sufferings in the cause of the Homoousion, which he considered as the sole pleasure in business, as the duty, and as the glory of his life. Amidst the storms of persecution, the Archbishop of Alexandria was patient of labor, jealous of fame, careless of safety, and although his mind was tainted by the contagion of fanaticism, Athanasius displayed a superiority of character and abilities which would have qualified him far better than the degenerate sons of Constantine for the government of a great monarchy. His learning was much less profound and extensive than that of Eusebius of Caesarea, and his rude eloquence could not be compared with the polished oratory of Gregory of Basil. But whenever the primate of Egypt was called upon to justify his sentiments or his conduct, his unpremeditated style, either of speaking or writing, was clear, forcible, and persuasive. He has always been revered in the Orthodox school as one of the most accurate masters of Christian theology, and he was supposed to possess two profane sciences less adapted to the episcopal character, the knowledge of jurisprudence and that of divination. Some fortunate conjectures of future events, which impartial reasoners might ascribe to the experience and judgment of Athanasius, were attributed by his friends to heavenly inspiration, and imputed by his enemies to infernal magic. But, as Athanasius was continually engaged with the prejudices and passions of every order of men, from the monk to the emperor, the knowledge of human nature was his first and most important science. He preserved a distinct and unbroken view of a scene which was incessantly shifting, and never failed to improve those decisive moments which are irrecoverably passed before they are perceived by a common eye. The Archbishop of Alexandria was capable of distinguishing how far he might boldly command, and where he must dexterously insinuate, how long he might contend with power, and when he must withdraw from persecution. And while he directed the thunders of the Church against heresy and rebellion, he could assume, in the bosom of his own party, the flexible and indulgent temper of a prudent leader. The election of Athanasius had not escaped the reproach of irregularity and precipitation, but the propriety of his behavior conciliated the affections both of the clergy and of the people. The Alexandrians were impatient to rise in arms for the defense of an eloquent and liberal pastor. In his distress he always derived support, or at least consolation, from the faithful attachment of his parochial clergy, and the hundred bishops of Egypt adhered with unshaken zeal to the cause of Athanasius. In the modest equipage which pride and policy would effect, he frequently performed the episcopal visitation of his provinces, from the mouth of the Nile to the confines of Ethiopia, familiarly conversing with the meanest of the populace, and humbly saluting the saints and hermits of the desert. Nor was it only in ecclesiastical assemblies, among men whose education and manners were similar to his own, that Athanasius displayed the ascendancy of his genius. He appeared with easy and respectful firmness in the courts of the princes and in the various turns of his prosperous and adverse fortune, he never lost the confidence of his friends, or the esteem of his enemies. In his youth, the primate of Egypt resisted the great Constantine, who had repeatedly signified his will that Arius should be restored to the Catholic communion. The emperor respected and might forgive this inflexible resolution, and the faction who considered Athanasius as their most formidable enemy was constrained to dissemble their hatred, and silently to prepare an indirect and distant assault.' 
They scattered rumors and suspicions, represented the archbishop as a proud and oppressive tyrant, and boldly accused him of violating the treaty which had been ratified in the Nicene Council with the schismatic followers of Miletius. Athanasius had openly disapproved that ignominious peace, and the emperor was disposed to believe that he had abused his ecclesiastical and civil power to prosecute these odious sectaries, that he had sacrilegiously broken a chalice in one of their churches of Mariotis, that he had whipped or imprisoned six of their bishops, and that Arsenius, a seventh bishop of the same party, had been murdered, or at least mutilated, by the cruel hand of the primate. These charges, which affected his honor and his life, were referred by Constantine to his brother, Dalmatius the censor, who resided at Antioch. The synods of Caesarea and of Tyre were successively convened, and the bishops of the East were instructed to judge the cause of Athanasius, before they proceeded to consecrate the new church of the resurrection at Jerusalem. The primate might be conscious of his innocence, but he was sensible that the same implacable spirit which had dictated the accusation would direct the proceedings, and pronounce the sentence. He prudently declined the tribunal of his enemies, despised the summons of the synod of Caesarea, and after a long and artful delay, submitted to the peremptory commands of the emperor, who threatened to punish his criminal disobedience if he refused to appear in the council of Tyre. Before Athanasius, at the head of fifty Egyptian prelates, sailed from Alexandria, he had wisely secured the alliance of the Miletians, and Arsenius himself, his imaginary victim and his secret friend, was privately concealed by his chain. The synod of Tyre was conducted by Eusebius of Caesarea, with more passion and less art than his learning and experience might promise. His numerous faction repeated the names of homicide and tyrant, and their clamors were encouraged by the seeming patience of Athanasius, who expected the decisive moment to produce Arsenius alive and unhurt in the midst of the assembly. The nature of the other charges did not admit of such clear and satisfactory replies, yet the archbishop was able to prove that, in the village where he was accused of breaking a consecrated chalice, neither church nor altar nor chalice could really exist. The Arians, who had secretly determined the guilt and condemnation of their enemy, attempted, however, to disguise their injustice by the imitation of judicial forms. The Synod appointed an Episcopal commission of six delegates to collect evidence on the spot, and this measure, which was vigorously opposed by Egyptian bishops, opened new scenes of violence and perjury. After the return of the deputies from Alexandria, the majority of the council pronounced the final sentence of degradation and exile against the primate of Egypt. The decree, expressed in the fiercest language of malice and revenge, was communicated to the emperor and the Catholic Church, and the bishops immediately resumed a mild and devout aspect, such as became their holy pilgrimage to the sepulchre of Christ. End of chapter 21, part 4